The one out of season four yet, we got plenty to cover here. Before we can properly begin with this segment, I need to call attention to a joke I made in my previous Escape the Night review. See you next season, Star! I totally expect not to care about you. Clearly past me was high of his ass, cause Star survived! Over that might be, by the way. We're fine. Do you know what this means, ladies and gents? That means that Star is the first savant in Alex's series to survive an entire season. Now that doesn't sound like an achievement since Joey survived every season of Escape the Night. Or at least, made it to episode 10. But considering that no one in this series has plot armor, something Joey does, I'll call it an achievement. The other guests are fun as well, with three of them, Carlos, Kid Wiz, and Lucky, being fellow Fan ETN creators. I'm impressed with how much personality they, and the other guests for that matter, gave to the screen, and it was sad to see them go. With one exception. YT YT the musician is a bit of a standout among the cast. Not for anything he did in the season, because by the series by the season's end game, he basically forgotten about the poor bastard. No, I'm talking about things he did outside the season. For obvious reasons, after all of this came to light, he YT YT was effectively erased from the series as much as physically possible. Which means no tarot card slash character poster, no reveal trailer, and his presence in the three episodes he was in were downplayed as much as possible. The NPCs we have for this season are Amara the Vote Taker, this girl, only credited as the swimmer, the infected then cured student, Alice, Charles the Mechanic, Sally, and finally Diane. Frankly, I'm not really fond of these characters, unlike season 2 where they hang around for the majority of their episode. Here, the NPCs sometimes only appear for a single puzzle, and two of them don't even have names. Well, I don't exactly mind the lack of decent NPCs, there are good ones. Amara is the best vote taker, and Alice had a few good moments, and Diane was just epic because the cast is so strong they make up for it. I just can't help but feel a bit iffed, you know? The monsters in this season, while sticking somewhat close to the school theme, are quite diverse. We have the Shadow King and the Shadow Children, a Wendigo, three sirens, a literal dollhouse. No, I'm not kidding. The Herbology teacher and her test subjects, the Red Queen and her knights, the malfunctioning machines, and finally, the circus master and his gang of clowns. Unfortunately, most of them don't really have a character to speak of. Given only half of the lieutenants speak, and even then, with the exception of Archie here, most of them command silent drones, there really isn't much of a chance for any of them to build an actual character to give an impression beyond they exist to guard the gem. An exception is the Red Queen. The Queen is basically dethroned Mortimer from season 2 as my favorite lieutenant because she isn't an idiot and gives zero fucks. When the guests arrive to get her gem, she just orders them to be killed the first chance she gets. No death challenge, no games, just skipping straight to murder. Well, of course, she does eventually force all the guests into a challenge anyway, but a show of intelligence like this is definitely a good way to make an antagonist memorable. The other exception is Archie, the carnival master, who is just a delightfully despicable prick and it was satisfying to watch him burn. Mistress Lydia is probably the best antagonist in the series. She's just so delightfully petty and hateable. Plus she has a backstory beyond, something bad happened, then I want to destroy the world. We do eventually get to end of the world stakes by endgame, but we'll get there when we get there. Our story begins with two sisters, Lydia and Diane. Diane, the older sister, was given all the attention from her parents, learning magic with the family wand, while her sister Lydia was left to do chores, baking treats in an attempt to impress her parents and get them to notice her. When they don't, Lydia devises a plan to steal the family wand and her father's spellbook so she can finally impress her parents, but accidentally starts a fire that kills them both because the sleeping potion she drugged them with worked a little too well. Distraught over her accidental murder and her failed murder, as Alex confirmed in his Discord server, go join that by the way, link in the description and pin comment, that Lydia attempted to kill Diane in the house fire. She devises a plan to cast a spell to split them apart so she can bring back her parents. After locking up her sister in the manor's dungeons and giving the lieutenants the eight gems to keep the manor's barrier intact, and by doing so, she's also indirectly responsible for eight murders, she's almost able to cast a spell, but the guests and Diane break into the attic going, Gotcha, bitch! And Diane blows both of them to hell. Literally. Now, some people have actually sympathized with Lydia enough, or just hate Diane that much, to, to call Diane the actual villain instead of Lydia for the role she played in her backstory. Hey, Star, what do you think of that? 
That's bullshit. My thoughts exactly. I can understand sympathizing with Lydia because she accidentally killed her parents and just wants to bring them back. And if it was that alone, I'd actually feel a bit sorry for her. But like I said in the story breakdown, it's her pettiness and unwillingness to admit she's responsible for her parents' death that overshadows any redeeming quality she has. Hell, she never even says she's sorry or expresses any proper regret for what she did. Instead, insisting that she... I need them back. Whatever it costs, I deserve to have them back. The only reason Diane is able to get close enough to change the spell is because she plays to Lydia's ego, saying she'll help her complete the spell. Notice how, despite hitting her sister in literally every previous scene where they're together or she's mentioned, Lydia welcomes her over with open arms with barely any hesitation. Something I do need to acknowledge is that Diane isn't exactly innocent. She was the sole focus of her parents' attention and was apparently aware of the effect this was having on her sister. But... Even if we do subscribe to the theory that she was aware at the time and did nothing about it, Lydia still comes off as worse. I mean, Lydia is the one who drugged her parents with a sleeping potion and intended to kill her sister with a house fire after stealing the family wand and spellbook, only to kill her parents instead. She then decided to cast a spell to split time in order to get them back, only after trying to lock up her sister for trying to stop her, killing her servant for 15 years with zero remorse, turning teachers into monsters against their will, giving every kind of wrong person access to demonic powers, and let them murder as they please, leading her to be indirectly responsible for eight murders. And when finally confronted with all of this, she still denies responsibility. In summary, even with her sympathetic backstory and motivation, to an extent, Lydia is just way too unlikable to actually really feel sorry for. And I think that was the point. A school in the 1950s doesn't sound like an interesting place to kill people, but you'd be surprised. Wait. The Validian Academy, much like the museum in Marble Fort, starts off as a fun place to explore, with each episode bringing a new room in the school and other areas surrounding the main building. But like the settings before, the other episodes focus more on areas outside the school, though unlike the mall and museum, the other areas still tie into the whole school theme, with every episode starting with the guests going to that lieutenant's respective classroom. With exception to episode 5, because the dollhouse takes place almost entirely in, well, the dollhouse. While we do often leave the school, it still feels all connected and focused, which is nice. Yeah, this series looks fucking amazing. You get a small hint of the spectacular visuals to come from this one shot. The light shining at the end of the hallways and the light rays casting when Star walks in a frame look incredible. There's also a surprisingly amount of good camera work to complement the added amount of cinematics. Establishing shots at the beginning of episode, this epic Dutch tilt after the guests get sucked into the dollhouse, and the entire sequence where Catherine reboots the other robots, and especially the final sequence. This series is just a marvel visually. That also goes for the effects. The way text interacts with the environment reminds me of the text from Zombieland. There's also a bit more sound design. Whenever something opens, like a wall or a shulker box is revealed, there's always the sound of things moving like gears or stone shifting, giving the viewer the impression there's actual mechanics to what they're seeing and it's not just magic. All in all, it's just great. Oh, this'll be fun. Lizzie bites the dust by being consumed by the Shadow King, Whitey Whitey is beaten to death by the Wendigo, then eaten, Fair Fox is pulled underwater, drowned, and presumably eaten by the Sirens, Carlos burns in the dollhouse, Danny gets colleened, Kid Wiz gets beheaded, kinda, gets into he went flat. Luna gets her vocal cords ripped out, and finally, Lucky is hanged. Hung. Shut the f*** up! Notice something interesting? Let me explain. In my Season 1 and 2 review, when ranking the deaths, I gave them categories of their own. Stabbing, falling, and the unique or other deaths. Alex in this season topped them both by having entirely unique and creative deaths. And even for the more mundane deaths, they're still executed well. Pardon the pun. And, in case you're wondering what sparked this sudden boost in variety for the kills? I did. No, I'm not kidding. Alex said on his server that my review made him realize he should make the deaths more interesting, and based on this category, he succeeded. So, to answer my question from the start, how well does this season hold up against what came before? 
Damn well. The guests, with one annoying exception, are all funny and entertaining. The villain is so bitchy and hateable. The school is a fun place to explore. The visuals are incredible. The deaths are delightfully twisted. And much like last season, the music is awesome. How awesome, in fact? I've been using it throughout this review. With permission, of course. Is there right out? Of course, not everything is top quality amazing. The NPCs aren't exactly the best, with two exceptions, the monsters are barely characters, and there's plenty for me to nitpick like, where'd the bus come from? Where did the Wendigo go after episode 3? Same with that swimmer. Why the hell are the swim team considered students if Archie's the only student with a gem? Where did the Shadow King come from? Every other guardian was someone in the school, so where'd this asshole come from? But, like I said, this is just me being a nitpicky prick. This season is amazing, and it's unfortunate it didn't get the attention it deserves. That's no good. Seriously, the average amount of views for a season 2 episode is around 2,835. The average for season 3 is 1,374. And even if you suck at math, the drop from episode 1 to 2 is jarring. That shit is sliced in half! Seriously, go watch Alex's season 3 and show that all the blood, effort, sweat, passion, and tears that he put into this season was worth the damn. Just the fact that some people consider his series underrated is just mind boggling. Links to Alex's YouTube channel as well as the season 3 playlist will be in the description, as well as the playlist for my season 3 reactions. I'll also have an invite to Alex's Discord server there too. You should consider joining, it's a good time. And with all that being said, my name is Ximon, and this has been GG Reviews. And thank you for listening. Hey guys, Nick Simon here doing my usual end of episode spiel again. This is technically my third, technically third, wait, I guess if you count the spiel I did at the end of part, part one. And now I consider this more my end of episode. This is that was end of part. <laughs> this is end of episode. So yeah, um, I had a list of topics I want to talk about. I immediately forgot them as soon as. I... <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. So um, before I go, before sorry, there's noise. There's noise going on out there. All right, sorry, sorry. So now blah, blah, blah. anyway, before I begin with any of the topics, I just, I just remembered. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the positive reception. I know on YouTube it doesn't look like the first part got a lot of positive reception aside from the likes, which, holy shit. Um, that's... <laughs> likes don't seem like much, but, you know, it, it warmed my heart to see such a positive... such... You know, it, it wasn't much, but it was just seeing eight likes, and I think a video that has 70 views when I'm recording this. This probably... It might spike later, like my other ETN review, but who knows? But, um... It was just so nice to see. And people on Alex's Discord, there are no comments in the video, again, as I'm recording this, as of this recording right now on the 30th of November, the de December, the English, uh, uh, on the 30th of December, there are no comments right now, but on the on Alex's Discord server, where they just shut all the links and shit, there was such a positive reaction. Alex himself even you know, added everyone saying, it's finally here, you know. You know, and uh, just a positive reaction. People saying that they genuinely liked it. And, you know, um, someone else, I don't remember their name at, at this uh, time, even said, you know what, I'm going to watch it again, you know, when I initially thanked them, you know, thank It was just nice to see. I was a bit worried when I had to split it in half because I didn't want to do that. I really didn't. But I didn't see any foreseeable way for me to upload the entire thing at once, so I decided to split it in two. The story is gonna be its own segment, and here's everything else. So, here's everything else. Um, another thing I wanted to do was include more music. So you probably heard a bit more background music. Um, yeah, the background music, that's the thing I want. Um, Alex did genuinely give me permission. I kind of wrote that in the script when I was writing it, because I'm like, yeah, I'll do that, but then I realized, shit, I don't technically have permission. Oh wait, I'll just make that the joke. Um, but Alex did actually give me proper permission, you know, um, when I asked him, hey, the right if I, I genuinely did ask him, hey, it's okay if I can use your music, and he said, oh, fucking course, and then I asked him to do the skit, 
which he also did with that hesitation again. That little uh, Nick, Nick the Gamer emote with the gun wasn't planned by me, but, you know, it was funny. I thought it was good. <laughs> It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, I told two. I told. I told two of my friends to tell me to fuck off, and they were like, "Dope." <laughs> but uh, yeah, the music also is great. I do. I generally do mean that. This season is the best so far. But another thing I didn't mention that I wanted to mention this review, but I forgot about it, are the actual intros themselves. I want to quickly rank which ones I like. Um, if I had to rank from best to worst, it would probably be. Shockingly, season one is the best, with um, closely followed by season three, and then by season two at the bottom. Let me explain. Um, I think it comes to the music. Um, um, the music for season one's intro is Something Wicked by... Fuck. Uh, something Wicked by Ross Burgeon. Or Burgeon. I... I I keep on forgetting how to spell his last name. I use I use two of his tracks in almost like every video I upload, even even this one. <laughs> um, but yeah, something wicked is like it's not the exact Escape the Night theme. Not, I don't think any theme can beat that. But I think it's the closest we have to true. It's it's the only one of the of the of the two themes used that really feels Escape the Night. The piano piece in the season two and three, or the season uh, season two and three. It's fine, but it doesn't feel a lot really escape the night. And plus, it's at, and plus the season one intro is also closer in that, you know, we see the characters doing things in the middle of activities, running, you know, you know sitting in the middle, in, you know, in the midst of things, in the midst of the chaos, whereas season two and three are just slideshows. You know, season two was just a generic slideshow over generic backgrounds, where at least season three had the decency to, you know, um, incorporate more of the school theme theme with all with it being in like on paper you know and the characters looking like something that you'd see in like a sketchbook and then there's the cool animatic with and you know the, lo the logo in pieces over the key and then you get a couple of those cool cg i think shots you know crediting alex and credit saying it was created by nobody alex inspired by joy Persefa, and then you get that full title card at the end that was cool I think that I think the music fit there a little bit better, but I still prefer something wicked over that piece. I don't know if it has a name. Uh, if there is a name, I'll, I might put it in the description or something like that. Also, I'm recording my phone like I usually do, so then the notification popped up. So I'm like, get rid of that. <laughs> um, another thing um, about the there's a. Shortly after I after I'm done recapping episode one, there's a good chunk of black space. Let me explain that. Um, originally, it was gonna cut to camera, you know, me in character, talking about how hey, you know, when you think about it, since the Shadow Children and the Shadow King are the first guardians and they guard the first gem, by unleashing them, Lydia indirectly set up her own defeat. What a dumbass! Cut to that George Carlin. What are you fucking stupid clip? You know. Dogs. Yeah. Did you hear that? I'm sorry. They bark a lot. I'm frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky with all the footage I was able to record without them barking. <laughs> I don't like recording when other people are in the house. <laughs> anyway, that's what Jenna thought. Right? Yeah, that there was originally it was originally going to cut to another gag, but. No one really brought it up, so I guess it's not an issue, so, but I brought it up now, so people are going to know this. Fuck. <laughs> um, another thing. All right. Um, the Last of Us. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the previous part in the end of Shitspiel, but yeah, I did not write that Last of Us. Uh, the, the Last of Us. This script was written, like, shortly after episode 10 aired. I'm pretty sure I got most of it down within a week. Like, I, I had all... I had all of it down, most of it down within a week, with the exception for the deaths, because I'm like, wow, I scripted this fast. Maybe I could leave room in the middle for another review, which never happened. So, yeah. I ended up kind of holding on the script for basically no reason, because I procrastinate like a motherfucker. <laughs> but, you know, it was amazing. I was speaking from the heart. It, I, all the words just came from the heart straight down to the page. It was easy. It was probably the easiest time I ever had writing a script because I knew exactly what I wanted to say when I watched it. 
So when I watched the series, I knew exactly what I was going to say, what jokes I was going to tell. I, probably because I went into the mindset of, I'm going to review this, which I didn't do for season one and two until after when the idea sparked. So it, it was just, I, I had a great time writing this, doing the review, and I'm really happy that people loved the first ep- first part. Even... <laughs> And you know, the first video works okay on its own, but it is just a piece. It's not the entire picture. I say that, but it's probably, it's most of the picture since this video is like not barely even half its half the first video's length. But, you know, this is still the rest of the picture, so yay. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is my final send off to 2020, this year that happened. Um, I don't know what else to say other than I got something of a boost in this year, so that's something... I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know what to say other than thank you so much for watching, supporting my videos, reacting, responding to me. Um, here's to something better in the future. The dog's barking again, yay! <laughs> um, I don't really know what to say. Getting a positive response on my videos or comments or, you know, even if they're not directly, uh, even if they're just talking about the video, like I didn't, I'm still in that, I'm still in that phase where it's like any, po- any sort of positive, genuine positive response. Like, hey, I liked that. That was really cool. That means the world to me. Even if it's just one person saying it, it means the world when someone likes what I do because I, I just don't. Me personally, I think my reviews are shit. <laughs> They're nowhere near what I want to make. And I, I do hope to eventually, if I do really continue, I don't want to dedicate myself completely to the reviews because I still want to do other things, but if I continue the review pa- down the review path and I can become more dedicated, I want to make something, things that are bigger and better. But that's for the future. And let's hope our future is a bright one. <laughs> So I'm gonna, I, have, I think I've ran out of things to ramble about. So I'm just gonna shut off this camera, put this shit into there, and then, and then give 2021 met one last proud middle finger because fuck this year sucked. I mean, it's the year I got a job. It's the year people actually started finally notice me, but Fuck, it sucked for everyone. It even still sucked for me because fucking Christmas, Dollar Tree. Ugh. I mean, I might make videos rambling about that with friends. I don't know. Maybe. But that's for next year because I, I'll just shut this thing off. I'm done. I'm done taking your time. Merry Christmas. That already happened. Have a happy new year. All that fun shit. Be good people. Stay safe. Wear your fucking mask. For the love of God. Please. I don't know if you, I, you probably understood none of that, but just be safe, wear your mask, stay, wash your hands, all that fun shit. Just be safe out there and be good people. My name is Nick Simon, and uh, thank you so much for watching and listening. <laughs>